Welcome to the Summit Series with Ari Melber. Today we are joined by one of the most accomplished moguls in the industries of music and culture. Scooter Braun is behind so many well-known artists from Justin Bieber to Ariana Grande to Jay Balvin, one of Time's 100 most influential people in the world and many other things. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, you have a record of identifying value that other experts didn't see. You've done that with artists, you've done it with investments. Uh, how do you do that? I would love to tell you that I have like some special touch or some formula. I, I can tell you, I would probably say it's a combination of luck um, and, and just a gut. You know, sometimes I just get a feeling in my gut that it's, it's almost like falling in love. You know, when you're going out there and they say, how do you fall in love? And you can't just walk out to the supermarket and fall in love. It just shows up when it shows up and you feel it. And I think that that's happened to me many times in my career um, where I've been able to feel something and say, this is special. Identify something's missing in the market. I know what to do here. A lot of people use conventional wisdom or what the experts say, and then they work within that. So you don't, and you come up young and other people have more experience. They have more accomplishments. They probably have more money. And we'll get into examples, but just at the conceptual level, what is it that allows you to ignore, would you say, disregard what the experts are saying in the business? Um, look, I think the entertainment business uh, is, is very youth driven. So I'm 40 now. And each year that goes by, I think I'm the first one to admit maybe I'm getting slowly and slowly out of touch in certain ways. Right now, we still have it. We're still having a lot of success. And, in new acts, old acts, and different genres of uh, entertainment and investments, but um, I'm relying more and more on really great, brilliant people on our team. Um, what I can tell you is it, it was more of a concept of why not me, why not us? Um, when I was younger, uh, my father would talk to me about not being intimidated, and you've heard I'm very, I'm not the most conventional, as you said, so. Uh, People would say, imagine everyone naked. But I never did that because someone might have a great body and I imagine them naked. That's very intimidating. Yeah, it kind of throws um, you off. Yeah, it throws me off. But um, my dad, I'm sure you've never heard this before in an interview. My dad told me to imagine everyone is on the toilet just like you. Right, because they're a human being. A human being. And when you imagine someone who you're supposed to be intimidated by sitting on a toilet, having the same experience you have on a toilet, you aren't intimidated anymore. You see the humanity in that moment. Uh, and and uh, I kind of went through life with that idea that we're all equal, we're all the same. So why not go with my ideas, go with my dreams? And, and my parents really instilled in me, maybe it was almost false, but they instilled this confidence in us that you can go and pursue things and if you work hard, you can achieve them because my family came here from other places. My dad was a refugee, it was an immigrant family and they really believed in the American dream. You've said that that history in your family makes you feel like everything could be taken away. Is that paranoid? Or when you look at people's experience in Ukraine or people's experience in COVID, your facility with that in your own family's history made you more aware of, of that uncertainty in a real way? Um, I think there's a, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, my grandparents are Holocaust survivors. My grandmother was in Auschwitz. My grandfather was in Dachau. And I grew up, as far as I can remember, with the stories of the Holocaust, of why certain family members aren't here, what happened to us, um, and that part of our history, and also this idea of never again, you know, that there's a responsibility in this to make sure this never happens again. So it was almost as a child, I was being told, tomorrow can be taken away from you. Like when my grandmother was 14, the Nazis showed up at her village, and within a week, 26 members of her family were gone. Did that make you more likely to identify with people who are different or marginalized? Because so many artists, especially the ones that we, that we tend to love and be inspired by, are a bit different. When you are realizing that you're different, realizing that you see the world different, when, you, when you're growing up with that little bit of bravery and a little bit of fear, um, you recognize that in other people. And I wanted to help people. I wanted to be a part of it. I think what I ended up doing as a job was helping people go after their dreams. And um, that, that was something that gave me a lot of satisfaction in my own life because I think I probably felt a little bit of guilt growing up, not nearly as with the struggle that my grandparents or my parents even. Mm. Um, so I was identifying with others and 
and I wanted to treat people with that same respect I was looking for. It's interesting you say that because you have that guilt. You had guilt about whether Asher Roth was big enough. You have guilt about all these people in your life. That seems to be something that powers you, but have you, have you gotten to a point where you say, oh man, I leaned on that so much, I need, I need to get off that? Well, yeah, I think you're meeting me at a time in my life where I'm in a very different place. Um, I think the last two years, especially through COVID, um, I found myself uh, going deep into my own self-work for the first time probably ever. Um, so while I was, uh, you know, when I was younger, I think I needed everyone else's validation. So I wanted them to be happy. And I think as I got older, I got to a place that I realized that I, uh, I could, it, is, it might sound cheesy, but you know, you can love yourself. And if you have self-love and you know that you're a good giving person, that build that within yourself, be selfish for yourself and it will be to others. And what I mean by selfish is giving. I like to give. I think it's the greatest feeling in the world. What age were you when you felt that you reached that ability to have self-love? Um, I think in the last year and a half, two years. Really? Yeah, I think I, think I, I, think I got there for Scooter, uh, that part of me a long time ago. I think I built the Scooter uh, version of myself and I had a lot of self-love for that, but I don't think I, I had it for Scott, the kid. I think Scooter was 18 on and I went into a world, I think many of us do this, we, we create something that's strong enough for the world we're going into. Um, but I never went back and got that kid until recently. Because, you know, you're, you're well known, you know that, in the music field. And people in music, they look at you, they look at the pictures, they look at your contemporaries. Way before 38, they would think, yeah, you love what you're doing and you're loving your life. I did. I did. I, I, and I, I want to be clear, that part of my life was strong and stable and I loved it. And then when I got to a certain place, almost like at the top of that hill, I've heard J. Cole talk about this, a great artist, where he says, it's never what you think it's going to look like. Mm. And I have no, I'm not saying that I'm not grateful for everything that's happened to me. I am, and I want to continue doing what I do and what I love. It's just that when I got to a certain place, I started to ask those questions of, you know, what do I really want out of life? And I, and I actually got to turn to someone who's one of the most successful people in commercial history, Jeff Bezos. And I asked that person, one of the most successful people of all time, what do you want out of life? And this is during COVID. But I actually asked him, I said, what do you want? And he looked at me and he gave me a cheat code and he said, uh, I want to evolve. Hmm. I want to evolve as a person. I want to evolve as a father, as a friend. Um, and I realized you don't need $200 billion to start that. Do you know how many songs uh, have lyrics that cite you? I don't. 21 that we found. <laughs> okay. Um, the biggest one is probably Pop Star. You are in the video where Drake's saying he parties at Budokan and you'd think my manager was Scooter Braun. What does that mean? Um, before the song came out, obviously we did the video, uh, Justin and Khaled, we filled in for Drake. Um, and Drake made me aware of the lyric uh, ahead of time. How does Drake make one aware of a lyric? Just a text. Okay. Just a text like, hey, this is coming. And, you know, it was, and when I heard it, I, I kind of reached out and said, thanks. Um, I, you know, he was giving acknowledgement to what we've done in that field of music. I'd go further, I'll let you finish as it's said, but he's the artist of the decade, most streaming pop artist right now for a long time. And he's saying he has a level of success where one would think you manage him. I mean, that's kind of a big flex. Hey, look, I, uh, I've known him a long time. People don't realize if you go look at the Justin Bieber baby video, Drake's in that video, in the bowling alley. Really? Yeah, okay. and uh, we've known each other a long time. He's a brilliant artist and a great guy. And um, we've been there for each other throughout each other's careers behind closed doors. And um, I, I really appreciate the shout out. I, I told him he was probably 10 years too early because I got a seven year old, a five year old, three year old. And right now they don't really know what that means. But if they were 17, 15 and 13, that would be the coolest thing ever. So I was like, you know, it's just too early to make me cool to my kids. Yeah, and the video takes uh, Justin Bieber, who we'll talk about, who you launched, and looks at him as the quintessential pop star, but he's lip syncing the Drake lyrics. Is that a nod to how big Justin remains in our minds, or is it also almost kind of a self-parody about what it means to be a pop star today? I think uh, it's a little bit of both. I think um, Justin is that pop star for this generation. Um, and. He's a really brilliant artist um, who's shown he can go to every single genre. Uh, but at the same time, whether it was the Justin Bieber roast that, uh, that he did to himself on Comedy Central or times he's gone on comedy shows or even the way he'll use his social media, he 
he's very self-deprecating. Um, so I think he had fun with that one, and they're you know two friends from Canada, so uh, it worked out well. Yeah, Canada love. Ka Khaled was the big winner in that one. <laughs> Look, I, you know, you're pushing me on this idea of like, it's a it's a flex or it's a nod to you, and to me, I still feel like the kid in Atlanta, Georgia, at 19, who had big dreams and wonder if anyone's going to listen to these ideas, and you know, when yourself or friends might kind of push me to acknowledge what's taken place in my life. I always like to remind myself of, um, I read a book when I was 19 about David Geffen and it made me say, okay, I want to do this. He was this very famous manager and executive and went on to do all these things in entertainment. And he, he gave me some really great wisdom. He said, um, in a hundred years, no one's going to remember me. So they sure as hell won't remember you don't have an ego. And I think that's right. I think there's always going to be another person. There's always going to be the next person who does this, um, the next person who does something no one's ever seen before. And um, I think you don't go through life trying to be remembered for your name. I think you try to go through life leaving it better than you found it, making an impact, and understanding that in 100 years, no one's going to remember me. That's okay. The contrast for you, though, is you do have more prominence and notoriety than other people behind the scenes in music. And you seem very strategic. So the question becomes, do you use that not only for yourself, but for your artist? Does it help that Scooter Braun is a name? Because you could probably tick off five other people that might be involved, but don't have the prominence, certainly not the social media following that you have. You know, Diddy used to catch flack uh, for being out front back then. And in real time, you are bigger than that uh, compared to your artist now. Um, you know, when I was in Atlanta, uh, there was a group that was huge at the time and they had a manager who had worked really, really hard and put together those careers. Um, and funny enough, he was doing a party with Diddy and I was a party promoter back then. I was young. I think I was 20 years old or something. And one year he had a party where him and Diddy were on the bill together. And the next year that group broke up and it was just Diddy. And I thought to myself, I need to be able to build a brand that's sustainable beyond that so that I can even lift up the artists if I need to. And I started to build the company brand. And along the way, what ended up happening where my name got out there, Scooter's Easy, remember, Justin started talking about it in interviews. People would say, who discovered you? And they'd say, Usher. And Usher was a part of the story. He'd say, no, Scooter. And people started saying, who is that? And then we started kind of building, you know, brands that way. But I, like I said, double-edged sword. I'm pushing you on, is it an edge? If, you want, if you're doing business or pitching an artist, which you don't have to do anymore, is it an edge? I think sometimes. I think there's some artists that come to me because they already know who I am. Mm -hmm. But then there are artists who don't want that, which I can also respect, who say, hey, you know, I don't want to be near this and if they don't know me. What do you say to someone who looks at your career the way you looked at David Geffen's and says, how do I do that? or something like that now? First of all, they shouldn't, because I haven't achieved all that yet. Um, my advice to someone is, don't worry about what your career is gonna look like or how you're gonna get there. Find the thing you're passionate on, focus on that, and deliver on that. Um, and you know, you'll make plans and then life will show up. So you think you're gonna say, this is my five-year plan. That's just not how it's gonna go but try to have a burn the ships mentality, which uh, I always talk about. It's the idea that uh, Trojan warriors would land on the shores of their enemy and the generals would say, burn your ships. The only way you're going home to your children is on the ships of your enemies. There is no retreat. And I used to think of that as there's no retreat. There's no such thing as failure. And now I realize there's just no such thing as going back to tomorrow. You know, there's only in life moving forward. The only thing that exists is right now and now is now gone and now we're here. So my advice to someone is show up, start doing the work, stop talking about what you're going to do, get in the game and start moving forward. Um, I read something recently I really liked that said the only bad action is inaction. Mm. Um, you know, you have to make a decision to move forward. You think that you might make a mistake, but even the mistakes are for you as part of your process. So my advice to someone is to try. And should they focus on the fact that you started at a scale you could manage, being a young guy, throwing parties, then making connections, then going? Or could they start out higher because they look at you now doing $100 million deals, um, but you started really just working? I think start with what you have in front of you. 
I think, you know, anybody who's watching this, so many of us have talked about that dream that they wanted to go towards for so long, yet they keep saying, well, I'll get to it tomorrow. Get to it today, start somewhere. Don't worry about whether you're going to start higher or lower, start where you can and just start. And I think that's the best advice I can give to someone because I've talked to my own friends who are kind of in that place of like, well, how do I get going? You get going by going and you don't worry about whether it's big enough or that. I, I have friends who do it in relationships. Well, I, I can't get married and have kids until I'm successful. Well, you're saying that, but then you're gonna become successful and your excuse is gonna be, I don't know how to meet someone who knows me for me. Like, you know, if you want that in your life, move forward towards that and, uh, and stop making excuses why you can't begin the journey. With Justin Bieber, you discovered, launched, faced industry-wide rejection at first, and then went on to really tell his story in a new way. And it connected with him, obviously, but also something about your storytelling from the internet to the way you brought him out to people to this film that was such a big hit. Tells us something about how you tell stories. This is a little bit from the film. We put Justin in a van and on airplanes. He just got focused on what we had to do. There is not a DJ that can say they have not met Justin Bieber. And he won people over. Yeah, yeah. Wow. That was nice, man. Justin Bieber, do not forget us, nice. bro. Don't forget us. He started Twittering. I'm going to be at this radio station. I'm going to be at this radio station. First 20 kids, then 40 kids, then 100 kids, then a couple hundred kids started lining up outside of these radio stations to just get a glimpse of him. And they started to play his record. Did you make up this blueprint for him, or you just figured this was an avenue that other people in the industry weren't taking? Um, I think it's a combination, because Justin was the first one to do that. Um, and I did believe it was an avenue that no one was taking in the industry, where they weren't using YouTube properly, they weren't using Twitter properly. I'm only smiling because Justin's now 28, and, you know, that was, he was 14, 15 when those clips were going on. And to think it's been over a decade, and to see where he is now, and the career he's had, and the career he continues to have, I'm just very proud of him. So I'm kind of like having that, that proud, you know, pop a smile almost like, um, I'm just, he's, it's really remarkable because I don't think anyone's ever grown up the way he's grown up. I mean, it's uh, mm. 7 billion people on the planet. All the people before him, all the other stars never had social media. Um, so he was growing up with social media, a solo artist, the most followed person throughout his entire adolescence on Google, on Twitter, on Instagram and all these different things. No one in the history of humanity ever grew up like that. And he was able to get to the other side. And I think that's a testament to him. Um, blueprint or not, it doesn't work unless you got someone like him. So what does it tell you that so many labels passed on it? They weren't paying attention. Um, but that's why I said it's a youth driven business. You know, and when I meet young executives now who have passion for an artist the way I had passion for Justin, I always tell them, don't worry about selling me. You have all these tools that you can speak directly to people the same way I could. Use these tools to build the traction to where a point they can't say no, which is what we did. Um, Cause I'm gonna miss it. The older I get, the more I'm gonna miss the next thing. I'm not gonna understand it. You take that as a given. You just won't be able to do that. I think if you believe that you're gonna have the, the, the touch, that it factor for the rest of your life, it's never gonna go away, you are obnoxious. <laughs> um, I, I think that there's always gonna be someone coming along who's going to figure out something that you haven't figured out and that's okay. Um, I welcome that, you know, I, I root for the next guy. You know, I call it vacation theory, that if, uh, if I'm the only one winning, I gotta pay for all of our vacation, that's not fun. I want everyone to win. Then we can all go on vacation together. I don't, I don't have to handle the bill. We can all do it together. So, um, yeah, I, 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 that, was, that was a formula then, but I just saw Justin Lubliner do it with Billy in a different way, and uh, with Billie Eilish. And, and you see artists come along and do it, and it's great to see. What do Billy and Justin have in common? Both young people, incredibly talented, um, who I think a lot of people in the beginning didn't believe in and also faced a lot of adversity and uh, came up extremely young in, in a world where their talent sh shined through beyond and became these phenomenons worldwide. And I think Justin's protective of Billy because of that. People would also say to you, 
all right, you could do this, but don't make a movie about him. All right, you made a movie about him, but outsource the other stuff. Leave it to the experts. You keep pushing back and sort of doing it yourself. Does that empower artists to be more themselves if more of it's basically being done in-house or from their own view and not some other company? Well, I, I, I find that question really interesting because I've seen recently both sides. I've seen people say, oh, you're giving artists a voice. And then I've seen other people criticize, well, how serious can I take this? If you know this is if an artist is involved, if the artist is involved in the storytelling of this documentary or something, right? Because like that. I mean, we're here doing journalism. It's different if it's from the outside. There's a credibility outside, but there's an authenticity inside. Well, I think it goes both ways, and I think that that's why you have great journalists who keep their integrity. And unfortunately, we're in a world where there's a lot of journalists who don't keep that integrity. Um, and I think that you see that in the general public when they're questioning journalists. On the other side, if you're making a documentary that's just a fluff piece and not telling the truth, people are going to smell that out because they're going to continue to see that career and see where it goes. But if you look at Demi Lovato's most recent documentary, uh, their point of view was 100% in that documentary and they told the truth. And at the end, Demi was saying, you know, I believe in this kind of sobriety and we were saying, well, we don't necessarily agree. And then later on, Demi addressed it and said, I now believe something different. But at the time, that documentary was very real and very exposed and brutally honest to a point. It made some people uncomfortable. Um, and I think that sometimes an artist isn't necessarily going to give you that brutal truth unless they're allowed to be involved in the story pro process. And you have to find a filmmaker who they can trust. So this is interesting because everything you just said is about creativity and truth. But you're at the end of the day, you're the business guy. Uh, no one's gonna work with you if you don't handle the business really well. But what you're talking about would seem, or tell me if I'm wrong, to be above and beyond just the business bottom line. And that interplay you're talking about in that film is the same with where we see you with Jay Balvin, and you're showing the debate. You're not showing the finished product and saying, isn't he great, look what he did. You're actually honestly showing that back and forth, which for some people in his, in his country or based on the politics, they might criticize that and say they it did. should have been obvious up front what to do. Yeah, they did. So how do you do that as the business guy or is that the wrong read on you? I think it's the wrong read. I, I'm a firm believer uh, in what I call authentic marketing. I think if you tell the truth in today's world, if you really expose what's happening, if you really give the bottom line of who these people are, you're gonna have more of a long-term career. I mean, if you look at it today, with streaming, we have a la carte music. You can go on and you can listen anything in the world in your pocket right now. But if I name to you platinum selling artists of albums, you can tell me their story. You can say Katy Perry came from a Christian background and broke out. You can say 50 Cent, you know, got shot and he went there. You could say Kanye had his accident and, you know, this, that and the other. And you could say Justin Bieber discovered on YouTube and all the path from there. You could say Ariana Grande. We know so many aspects of her life. Um, you know these people's story. You know who they are. And I mm. think that to me, if you want to have a long-term career, you don't think about the quick money grab. You think about telling the truth and building a fan base that believes in you because people don't want to believe in a myth. They actually want to believe in something that they can relate to and something that's human is more relatable. Has that dynamic always been true or is it more pronounced in our mediated age? Um, I think that, look, David Bowie before could wear the costume and then disappear into his life and take it off. You know, take the makeup off and just be David Bowie. Um, I think now in today's age, because of social media and because of smartphones, it's more important than ever to be real and authentic and true to your to who your brand is. But to be very clear, whether David Bowie's wearing the makeup or not, that's still David Bowie. Right, and he's a great artist. It's David Bowie. So the process or the interplay that I mentioned is something that really we see in The Boy from Medellin with yeah. Jay Baldwin. And you're in it and you're talking to your artists about not only politics, which is always di tricky, and we can get to that, but politics in a foreign country. Uh, let's let's take a look at that. When you sign up to be a musician, your goal is never to be a politician. Hell no. But when you get a platform bigger than politicians, when you get a platform that you can inspire people around the world, it also comes with a responsibility. If you look at the history of musicians, artists have always been on the forefront of moving things forward because they're the voice of people. You know, like NWA, <laughs> you know, like they were the voice of that neighborhood. Great artists 
are the ones that use their voice for other people. You're taking a position. Did you know what he would do? He did follow your advice, so to speak. Um, at the time, no. I mean, we were in Medellin in Colombia at the time, and um, it, it was a very tough situation, but we were being very honest. That was a, a tough film to be a part of because Matt Heineman, who directed and, and made that film, also made Cartel Land. He's an Oscar-nominated documentary maker, and he had no interest in showing us this film until it came out. Um, the Demi documentary that we did with Michael Ratner, same thing. I didn't see it until it was finished. Mm. Um, so, you know, you're you're exposing yourself on camera, but you're also you're saying to this filmmaker, I think you're going to make something that's real, and I trust who these people are. Um, but yeah, I didn't know how that was going to come across until I was at the premiere. Wow. Um, but uh, but Jose, Jose, in the end. You know, that's a tough situation. It's a different culture, it's a different place. And he wanted to do right by his people and he went on that stage. And if you watch that film, it was really powerful what he, had, what he said on that stage. And he did speak for the people. And uh, I was very proud of him. Now you're in films, you're in international business. You mentioned David Geffen. Uh, he says you start with music because it's the fastest a song versus the, the yeah, runway for us. Music in a night, film, TV takes years. Um, but then he also tells you to get out. So did you always have the second or later acts planned? I don't know. I mean, my my brother Adam, like, uh, he always had, like, when he was younger, he had the five-year plan mine. I was just kind of just going. <laughs> um, I always have a plan, but it's more of a pivot plan. I kind of see what's in front of me, and it's like, you know, it's not the long-term chess game as much. Uh, it's more as I see what's in front of me, and I kind of navigate. Um, so... I knew I wanted to do other things. I knew I never wanted to just do, personally, I never wanted to just do music. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to wake up every morning and say, what intrigues me? What intrigues our team? What else can we do? Let's push the limits. Because you only get one turn at this life. Um, so I'm just fortunate enough that I've been able to do a lot of things, but I actually really still love the musicians I work with. Um, they are like family, and I am close to them beyond the job. So, and one day I won't be there in that capacity for them. I'm currently reading a, a book called Mastery and there's a, a chapter about apprenticeship and it says this idea that uh, to the master goes the sword. And eventually for someone that is the apprentice, they have to kill their master, but the great masters know to let go and let them become their own masters at a certain point. And I think my job is to help these, whether it be an artist or an executive or some, a business I've invested in, my job is to help. And eventually the goal is for them to go and be able to do it on their own. Um, and and, uh, and that's, that's my hope for everyone I work with, that they're gonna become as capable in every aspect of their life as they should be. So we're talking about talking to Jay Balvin about that political struggle and your comfort or your mastery, to use your word, in some of these fields. I mean, you've guided people through. I said the book says mastery. I'm, <laughs> I'm figuring it out. What also. would you call it? Um, I have a role and I hope that, you know, one day I might not be in that role and I hope that uh, everyone continues to win whether I'm there or not. You've also said that as a dad, Donald Trump's leadership was a problem, was an ethical problem. Uh, do you think about him running again? Do you worry about that or that's not where your focus is right now? Um, I haven't thought about it much. I know if he was to run, he would not have my vote. Um, and I'm not someone who's like, completely left wing or right. I'm more of a centrist, actually. Um, but my issue, to clarify what you're asking me, was I don't think the President of the United States should be on television making a speech, and I have to worry about having a moral conversation with my five-year-old. Mm. Um, and to me, I shouldn't have to come in and explain to my five-year-old, you know, uh, issues of race or uh, anyone who's disabled and have them ask me questions that normally should come from a bully on a schoolyard and have those questions actually be because of the comments made by the president of the United States when I left him alone in a room. I'm not okay with that. Hmm. Does politics come up directly with artists? Do they wanna know where you stand on things? I think when it comes to artists, I mean, look, you know, artists have played a very significant role, like I was telling Jay Balvin about in, um, in our process of uh, civil rights. So Sidney Poitier actually funded a lot of Martin Luther King's marches. 
um, and played a very large role in, in helping in those movements. Um, but my belief is if an artist is willing to do the research and educate themselves, then they deserve to have a voice just as much as anyone else. But if they're not going to educate themselves, I'd prefer they not say anything. And by the way, if I am not educated on something, I don't think I should say anything. What do you think about artists weighing in on, on COVID? I think it depends on the artist. Yeah. Every, there's a lot of artists in the world, a lot of people having different opinions, but uh, it's, you know, it's, I, I, there's, that's very vague and I don't know how to answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, that means you could go any direction. I mean, I was, uh, NLE Chapa the other day was talking about how often you should have bowel movements. Uh, and then that's was, exciting. <laughs> hey, that's truth. <laughs> yeah, it's true. And then in response, some people were saying, with all due respect, this is a 19 year old who doesn't have a background in medicine. <laughs> Listen, he said you should have five or six bowel movements a day and that shows that you're healthy and then a lot of people with more background in the issue said no well i would actually just say if he's able to do five or five <laughs> bowel movements a day good on him i don't even think i could do that if yes, i tried it's an effort <laughs> yeah i never I, you know you never know what's going to happen in a conversation I, didn't know what you're gonna get um, I do want to ask you about the big debate about artists owning their own work yeah and you have good relationships with a lot of your artists. Correct. Uh, you've also had a history with Taylor Swift. We're not gonna relitigate all that today. Uh, but there is a larger conversation about how artists under the system of laws and industry practices get to own their work or not. Um, so I'm, I'm very curious to have you react to that issue. And here's a little bit of what she you said. You probably don't know this, but most of your favorite artists do not own their work. There was something that happened years ago where I, um, I made it very, clear that I wanted to be able to buy my music. That opportunity was not given to me and it was sold to somebody else. And so I just figured I was the one who made this music first. I can just make it again. That means I own it, which is exciting. <laughs> <laughs> However you want to approach this, is it is it fair to say that artists should own some or all of their work or is it more complicated? Um, I completely understand where she was coming from. You know, I think, uh, the Beatles probably felt the same way when Michael Jackson bought their publishing. Um, the, the person who owned Taylor's Masters throughout her career was not myself. Um, and when I was buying a record label, I actually said to that group, at any point, if she comes back and wants to be part of this conversation, please let me know because I wouldn't do this deal. Um, I was shown an email that's been out public now uh, where she stated that she had decided to move on from that negotiation and wasn't interested in doing that deal anymore. So I thought at the time, okay, I'm in the clear, let's do this deal. And when I made the purchase, I was excited to work with all the artists who had catalogs there. Um, and I was always open to selling back people their catalogs along the way at a fair market value. Um, and I did present that. I, I don't speak about this publicly because I think people have said certain things, those narratives, aren't necessarily true. I think there's a lot of facts out there. Um, but at the ultimate, at the end of the day, I think artists should absolutely have ownership and um, they should play, play a role. A lot of artists have, all artists have royalties coming to them from their masters. Um, and if they want an opportunity to buy them, they should have that opportunity. And I'm completely open to that conversation. Uh, I will also tell you though, to have that conversation, you have to have a conversation. Mm. Um, you need to be able to sit in front of someone and have dialogue. And what you can't do is say that you want something and then never ever sit down at the table to have an actual dialogue. And I wish everyone well. And in fact, what I learned from that experience was that I would never do a deal again where everyone wasn't involved in saying, yes, I agree with this deal. Mm. I made the assumption. I made the assumption that everyone would be excited about us buying Big Machine. And that didn't come to be. Um, so I think that Taylor has every right to re-record. She has every right to pursue her masters. And I wish her nothing but well. And I have zero interest in saying anything bad about her because I've never said anything bad about her in the past and I won't start to now. The only thing I disagree with is weaponizing a fan base. Um, the artists I work with have very large fan bases. You don't do that. It's very dangerous. There's people within that fan base who have mental health issues, um, there's families involved. And I think that's very, very dangerous. And I know the artists that sometimes will weaponize are even the artists who say, 
I know what it's like to be ridiculed. Mm. Um, so I, I think that that's a very dangerous thing. And I, I think that there's a responsibility um, with a fan base. And you think that has happened? Um, that's all I'll say about that. Looking forward, are there changes that need to be made in the law, which artists in the record industry don't technically control, um, or in the practices to give artists more upfront? I mean, we hear about this in general, and then it doesn't seem to change a lot unless somebody um, is at a point in their career where they move what seems to be the standard. Well, I think our business people, they'll make certain deals, but I think the dialogue that you just presented um, brought a lot of awareness. Um, Prince talked about it in the past, and you are seeing artists who have decided to keep their masters or make different deals in the very beginning. Um, and you're seeing a lot of very prominent artists now making those deals. So I think there's always progress, and I'm all for it. Uh, as we look big picture uh, at your whole life, you've talked a lot about the role of your father. Um, what do you think makes him proudest about you? Um, I'd actually say my mom and my dad. Okay. Um, the thing probably that makes the proudest, I don't want to make any assumptions, but I'll guess, is that I'm still their kid. You know, through all of this, through everything that's happened in my life, um, I'm still their kid. And I'm still a brother to my siblings, and I'm still a cousin to my cousins, and I'm still a friend to my friends. But uh, never forget where you come from. And my grandparents were my heroes. Uh, and my grandmother worked in a sweatshop uh, throughout my dad's childhood. And she was my hero. So when I go out in the world and I see someone doing a job, I know my grandmother, will, she, wish, she wished she had that job. And she was my hero. So that's somebody's hero. Yeah. Um, you've been generous with your time. I'd love to do a lightning round with you. Sure. Ariana Grande. Kind, talented, generous. Justin Bieber. Coming into his own, leadership, talented, caring. Lil Dicky. Brilliant, loyal, hilarious. Ye or Kanye West. Teacher, uh, visionary, unique. Drake. Brilliant, focused, driven. DJ Khaled. Big ass heart. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy Iovine. Legend, mentor, keeps it real. Clive Davis. Legend. Uber. Game changing. Spotify. Saved a business. Apple Music. Continue to push us forward. Title. Quality. Joe Biden. President. Donald Trump. Not the president. <laughs> <laughs> Finish this sentence. I can tell someone's gonna be a star when. I can tell someone's gonna be a star when I get that gut feeling and they want the mic. The best way to manage an artist is? To be honest. The person I wish I'd discovered is? You. <laughs> <laughs> A little interview flattery, I get it. <laughs> the worst way to manage an artist is? To not think it's your responsibility to care. Mm. The one thing I wish I could change about the music industry is? Transparency. I was wrong when? I was wrong when I didn't check with everyone about my movement. I knew I'd made it when? I knew I made it when my firstborn was, was here. I thought it was over when? I thought it was over when that's a story that I'll go to my grave with. But there's something in your mind. It, my friends will know, but it's not for the public. Some things you just keep to yourself. Yeah, but you have, there, people oh, yeah. have that moment. You have oh, that yeah. moment. Oh yeah, I've had it many times. Yeah. But it's, uh, I think those are moments that I get to cherish because they've been my greatest lessons. Getting to the other side of those moments are the greatest lessons. Respect. Uh, final three. Failure means? Failure means you're on a pit stop to success. Success means? You're aware. Reaching the summit means? I don't think you ever reached the summit. I think we're all on this journey until one day we're not. I mean, I have to push back. You've been at some summits. <laughs> I, look, I think, like you said, I've been at some summits and then you find another one. And then, you know, you realize, like one of my favorite poems, Ithaca by Kafafi. You know, it's, uh, you think you're on, the, you're on a destination to reach Ithaca, but it was never about the destination. It was always about the journey to get there. Scooter Braun, thank you very much. Pleasure, thanks.
Really appreciate it. Absolutely.